Howell knew that the North could not be beaten, and he also knew that they were as weary of the war as was the South. But what Powell didn't know was that Lincoln had already been negotiating a peace with General Joe Johnston, an arrangement that accommodated all the conciliatory points being asked by the South, including the reestablishment of state governments and civilian benefits and civil rights allowances that would bring about a compassionate and forgiving end to the war. The actions of Booth and Powell actually hurt the South, because with the death of Lincoln, General Grant assumed authority under martial law, and Grant's military-only concessions would prevail, rather than Lincoln's leniency. General Joe Johnson finally surrendered on the 26th of April, followed by some outlaw outliers during the first week of May, and Powell's unit was one that held out for a week following Lincoln's assassination, and they were known as Mosby's Rangers or Mosby's Irregulars. And Powell himself had been one of Mos Mosby's favorite men. On Monday morning after Lincoln was killed, General Joe Johnston contacted the Union, Union General Sherman to ask for a meeting at a farmhouse in Durham, North Carolina. And they talked for a day and signed an agreed peace. But when John Wilkes Booth turned out to be a Confederate conspiracy rather than a crazy lone gunman, the better deal given General Joe Johnston was withdrawn as soon as Booth was certifiably dead, just after dawn on the 26th of April, and a harsher military surrender was imposed that day in Durham by order of General Grant. Mosby's Rangers had grown to 400 men by February of 1864 and they were little better than a roving band of thieves. And their order of battle was to sneak behind enemy lines and carry out acts of terror. And Mosby's base of operations was in Middleburg, Virginia, 40 miles west of Washington, D.C. Mosby's irregulars had used the Potomac River while carrying out their dirty work against the Union. And they had also used Maryland as a staging area. And to make up for that, Mos Mosby would faithfully serve the United States for the rest of his life after becoming a Republican and serving as one of General Grant and then President Grant's favorites. Among Mosby's accomplishments would be bringing justice to the cattlemen wars in the West, uprooting graft in the opium trade in China, indicting corrupt attorneys in the Department of Justice, and bringing charges of fraud against people trying to cheat the Indians. Mosby would be forced to retire at the age of 74, blind in one eye and cantankerous, and forced retirement would leave Mosby more time to play with the young George Patton, recreating Civil War battles, with Mosby playing himself and Patton playing Robert E. Lee. Mosby had disbanded rather than surrendering at the end of the war, and because Mo Mosby was more of a partisan guerrilla than an officer, a price had been put on his head by the Union General Hancock, first for $2,000 and then for $5,000, because Hancock knew that Mosby had been Powell's commander, and Mosby turned himself in on the 17th of June, rather than wait to be brought before the Lincoln Conspiracy Tribunal. Mosby's rangers had often discarded all semblance of a uniform during or after their operations, and they would melt in among the civilian population. And in September of 1864, Union forces executed seven of Mosby's men who had been caught out of uniform, and Mosby executed seven Union prisoners in reprisal. Powell had been with Mosby from the 1st of October in 1863 until he deserted in January of 1865. So he not only would have known the men executed, but would have known who had been responsible for it. And there is a good possibility that when Powell entered the Seward House on the 14th of April, seven months later, one of those Union officers had been on the premises. The irregular squads like Mosby's Rangers had been ordered by the Confederate Congress to disperse at the beginning of 1864 because the regular soldiers were jealous of them. 
watching them sleeping in warm houses and being allowed to keep the booty from their plundering raids, and the disparity between the privations of the regular soldier and the irregular raiders was too painful to maintain the army's morale. Two groups of them continued to operate outside even the reach of the Confederate Congress, and one of them was Mosby's Rangers. Powell was sent with a squad to Richmond in December of 1864, and what he saw in the city convinced him that the cause was lost, and perhaps what was left of his conscience made Powell realize that he'd been living a privileged life as a Mosby Raider, and that when the war was over he would be held to account for what he'd done while the people in the southern cities were suffering so terribly, and Richmond was second only to Atlanta in importance to the South. One requirement for being a Mosby man was that recruits needed to bring their own horse, and Powell sold his horse in Richmond and bought a train ticket to Baltimore. And while Powell, Powell was spending time with John Wilkes Booth in the spring of 1865, his former commander had been on the way to join up with General Joe Johnston. Newspapers were full of news about all the brave Southern commanders, and Powell still thought of himself as a soldier for the South, but instead of dying as a soldier with honor, he would hang as a common highwayman. The newspeople, the newspapers, had a field day during the war between the states, not just with the slavery debate, but with their reporting of northern troop movements in their newspapers. Sherman was here voicing the feelings of many federal commanders, as he probably was when having been informed that three journalists had been killed by an exploding shell, he exclaimed, Good! Now we shall have news from hell for breakfast! Before breakfast! Good! Now we shall have news from hell before breakfast! Honorable Treachery, A History of U.S. Intelligence, Espionage, and Covert Action from the American Revolution to the CIA by G. J. A. O'Toole, New York, The Atlantic Monthly Press, 1991, from footnote 18 on page 132, quoting from American Journalism, A History of Newspapers in the U.S. Through 260 Years by Frank L. Mott, New York, Macmillan, 1950, page 337. John Wilkes Booth was able to travel around during the war, and he could carry opium around by the suitcase full <coughs> and George Atzerott and John Surratt had been able to transport it across the lines into the suffering South. <coughs> John Wilkes Booth may have remained just a blowhard boasting about wanting to kill Lincoln, except that Powell emboldened him, and Powell had learned to be ruthless from one of the worst war criminals to ever have profited from the horror of war. John Wilkes Booth had started on the stage when he was 17 years old, and in 1855 he'd been playing the Earl of Richmond in Shakespeare's Richard III in Baltimore. And from there Booth went to Philadelphia for a season and then joined a stock theater company in Petersburg, Virginia, up the Appomattox River from Newport News. The Earl of Richmond that Booth played in Richard III, Richard III, had offered shelter to all the king's enemies, and he had raised an army to kill the evil king Richard III, and after becoming the king as Henry VII, the Earl of Richmond would marry the daughter of the previous enemy king, and that would unite the warring sides in England's civil war. The kicker was that in Richard III, the Earl of Richmond had personally killed the tyrant king Richard III and he killed him in the final days of the war. The first time Richmond spoke in Richard III, he said, Fellows in arms, and my most loving friends, bruised underneath the yoke of tyranny, thus far into the bowels of the land have we marched on without impediment, and here is but one day's march, in God's name cheerly on, courageous friends, to reap the harvest of perpetual peace by this one bloody trial of sharp war, all for our vantage, then in God's name march. True hope is swift and flies with swallow's wings, kings it makes gods and meaner creatures kings. Richard the Third, Act Five, Scene Two. The Earl of Richmond 
made a speech before the final battle that used the word tyrant three times and included the lines, God and our good cause fight upon our side. Those whom we fight against had rather have us win than him they follow. For what is he they follow? Truly, gentlemen, a bloody tyrant and a homicide, one raised in blood and one in blood established, one that hath ever been God's enemy. Then if you fight against God's enemy, God will, in justice, ward you as his soldiers. If you do sweat to put a tyrant down, you sleep in peace, the tyrant being slain. Then in the name of God and all these rights, advance your standards, draw your willing swords. For me, the ransom of my bold attempt shall be this cold corpse on the earth's cold face. But if I thrive, the gain of my attempt, the least of you shall share his part thereof. Sound drums and trumpets boldly and cheerfully, God and St. George! Richmond and victory, Richard the Third, Act Five, Scene Three. Powell especially liked hearing the Richmond and victory part. Having seen that devastated town that had caused him to desert from the army, and the final speech in Richard the Third belonged to Booth's Earl of Richmond, a call for the end, for an end to the Civil War, along with his declaration of imminent marriage to his beloved. At the end of the play. John Wilkes Booth stood triumphant, the hero that had brought peace to the kingdom by killing the evil king, and he was surrounded by his admirers as the curtain fell at the conclusion of his final speech that was three times as long as this excerpt. Smile heaven upon this fair conjunction, that long have frowned upon their enmity. What traitor hears me and says not amen? England hath long been mad and scarred herself. The brother blindly shed the brother's, brother's blood. The father rashly slaughtered his own son. The son compelled been butcher to the sire. All with treason wound this wound this fair land's peace. Now civil wounds are stopped. Peace lives again, that she may long live here. God say amen. Richard the Third, Act 5, Scene 5. In 1858, Booth played Horatio to his brother Edwin's Hamlet, and by the end of the decade he'd been earning over $20,000 a year, when the average yearly salary for a good workman was $500. Booth began touring in 1860, and he traveled between New York, Boston, Chicago, Cleveland, St. Louis, and New Orleans. And he also played in the South, but after the war began, his engagements were only in the northern states or in border states. Booth was being heralded as a good talent with a great future, and he was especially popular with women and hundreds of photos of him were carried in the pockets of thousands of women, and his sister said that Booth had been using his position to smuggle quinine into the Gulf states to treat malaria. John Wilkes Booth had been on tour to various theaters in 1863, and in April he was in Washington, D.C. to play both Hamlet and Richard III, and he had, quote, taken the city by storm, close quote, and was, quote, a star of first magnitude, close quote. But the critics loved him less for his talent than for his outspoken opposition to the Union. In the summer of 1863, Booth played in Ohio and then toured New England, and he continued playing at numerous theaters throughout 1864, coming to Washington, D.C. for an engagement at Ford's Theater on the 9th of November in 1864. The only time the Booth brothers worked together was that month when they did was that month when they did Shakespeare's Julius Caesar in New York on the 25th of November and John Wilkes played Mark Antony and Edwin played Brutus and during the performance of that Julius Caesar at the Winter Garden Theater where Edmund Edwin was the manager squads of Confederates were racing around the city trying to burn down New York and they set fire to the building behind the Winter Garden Theater, with which it shared a car common wall, and the play was interrupted by the clanging of the bells of the fire engine. Edwin calm calmly stepped forward and assuaged the audience not to flee, assuaged the audience not to flee, and his Brutus had been in the orchard debating with himself whether or not to kill Caesar when the fire engine had arrived. 
After that single performance, Edwin would perform Hamlet on the New York stage until he was forced to lay low for a year after his brother assassinated President Lincoln. But Edwin would start playing Hamlet again in 1866, and in March of 1867 a fire set under the stage burned the entire Winter Garden Theater to the ground. When John Wilkes Booth had come to Washington, D.C. in January of 1865, He'd been meeting with his school friend Samuel B. Arnold at Powell's girlfriend's house in Baltimore. And Arnold had been discharged from the Confederate Army in 1864 for health reasons and had taken a job at Old Point Comfort near Newport News. Arnold and doc Dr. Mudd Mud would be sentenced to life in prison for complicity with the Lincoln conspirators, but President Johnson would pardon them in 1869, and Arnold had been arrested from his job in Old Point Comfort for his involvement with blockade runners. The heart of the matter was that John Wilkes Booth had something of a girlfriend named Lucy Hale, with whom he'd been seen more and more frequently in public at the beginning of 1865, and she was a fan of Abraham Lincoln, but Booth thought he could change her mind about that. In the spring of 1865, Booth had been quarreling with Lucy's father with increasing frequency, and shortly before the assassination, Booth had seen Lucy dancing with Robert Lincoln at the National Hotel. When the war broke out, Lucy's family had moved into the National Hotel, and her father was a senator who hoped that she would marry Robert Lincoln. And the morning of the assassination, Booth had seen Lucy studying Spanish with Robert Lincoln and one of Lincoln's closest assistants named John Hay, who had a small bedroom in the White House and was one of Lincoln's two personal secretaries. John Hay was said to have had excessive charm and was a very good-looking young man, and John Hay had often accompanied the Lincolns to the theater and had chaperoned Robert Lincoln at the bars, and one of Hay's duties had been to clash with Mary Lincoln over her personal household expenditures. It was said that Lincoln loved John Hay as a son, and according to Robert Gale, Hay loved Lincoln for, quote, his goodness, patience, understanding, sense of humor, humility, magnanimity, sense of justice, healthy skepticism, resilience, and power, love of the common man, and mystical patriotism, close quote. John Hay by Robert L. Gale, Boston, Twain Publishers, 1978, page 18. John Hay was two years older than Lucy, and John Hay and John Wilkes Booth were the same age and Lucy was two years older than Robert Lincoln. And in March, Lucy's father had just been appointed as the ambassador to Spain, an excellent move by Lincoln to get the promiscuous Lucy away from his 21-year-old son. Booth had talked to Lucy that fateful morning and discussed her father's transfer overseas. And Booth had dinner with Lucy and her mother at the National Hotel that evening on the 14th of April. And exactly at 8 p.m., Booth stood up and recited a line from Hamlet and excused himself to go prevent his beloved from being sent off to Spain. John Hay had also been a favorite of Secretary of State Seward and had spent more time at Seward's house than at the White House, and at the time of the assassination, Mary Lincoln had been trying to get rid of John Hay, which is why he spent so much time hiding out at the Seward's house. Booth may have learned from Robert Lincoln that John Hay was often at Seward's house, one block away from the White House. And when Lincoln arrived at Ford's Theater without John Hay, Booth's incendiary mood propelled Powell off to Seward's house to find the usurper of Booth's intended devotion. If Powell had returned without finding John Hay, the plan to kill Lincoln may have been postponed or shelved altogether, but no. There would have been no stopping the assassination that night because all the muses had lined themselves up. <clears throat> the original plan had been that Booth would kill both Lincoln and John Hay in the presidential box while Powell held the horses in the alley behind the theater. 
and then they would take the horses back to the stables and wait with George in the room at the Kirkwood for President Johnson to reward them in the morning. But John Hay had not arrived at Ford's Theatre with the Lincolns. Just then, as if sent from the gods at the final hour, Harold had entered the picture with his morphine delivery to the Seward house, so Powell could be dispatched to Secretary Seward's residence with a vow to take care of John Hay, and Booth was left at the starved tavern to wait for his return because Powell had ridden off with the forty-four six-shooter, leaving Booth with only a single-shot derringer. Booth waited in the Star Tavern for Powell to return with the good news that his romantic rival was finished, but instead the minutes ticked by and the play was nearing its end, which Booth could hear through the open windows. And since Powell had not yet returned, John Wilkes Booth acted on his destructive compulsion without knowing whether or not there would be any more interference from John Hay about Booth's obsession, and his last words would not be useless, useless, but Lucy, Lucy. John Hay could be dealt with later, because there were scores of cutthroats out there available for hire at reasonable prices even though money for Booth was no object, and when he and Powell had gone to the stables at 4 p.m., the only discussion had been about John Hay helping Lucy learn Spanish at the hotel that morning. Because Powell had volunteered to go to Seward's house to find John Hay, he would not be available to hold Booth's horse in the alley, and so Booth had to ask the theater people to hold his getaway horse in Powell's stead while Booth was inside killing Lincoln. If the little boy named Peanut had not been able to tell the police where Booth's horse had come from, since it was not Booth's regular horse, they never would have found out Powell's name, and Powell would have remained just another Confederate raider, skilled in deception and damage in disguise. In Washington, D.C., in January of 1865, Booth had begun playing Romeo in Romeo and Juliet and had been arguing with Lucy's father, and on the 14th of April, when Booth bade farewell to Lucy at 8 p.m. after dinner, he had quoted from Hamlet while kissing her hand and said, Nymph, in all thy orisons be all my sins remembered. Orisons, be all my sins remembered. That line was at the end of Hamlet's To Be or Not To Be speech in the first scene of Act Three. And the question in that speech was whether or not, quote, conscience doth make cowards of us all, close quote, that, quote, enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action, close quote. Southerners prided themselves on gallantry and were deeply involved in matters of honor and it is possible that Powell had risen to the occasion of taking it upon himself to intervene in the challenge that had gripped his friend John Wilkes Booth that day, and Powell may have pushed his way into the Seward home with the sole intention of giving John Hay a stern warning to keep away from Lucy Hale. But Powell had flipped out when the snobby Yankees started questioning him and blocking his way, and Powell just lost it, which would be consistent with his declaring, I'm mad, I'm mad, as he ran out of the house, the sort of insanity that had been a virtue within the ranks of Mosley's, Mosby's irregulars. John Wilkes Booth died right before his 27th birthday with a photo of Lucy in his pocket. And after Booth shot Lincoln and jumped down onto the stage, he brandished a knife and fired off a line from the assassination scene in Julius Caesar. And Booth really thought that Lincoln had it coming because for years the newspapers had been calling Lincoln a tyrant. Some historians thought that Booth was jealous of Robert Lincoln for having such a successful father, while his own father had abandoned a wife and child back in England so the marriage of Booth's mother may not have been legitimate and rendered the circumstances of the birth of John Wilkes Booth's Booth, John Wilkes and his brothers as questionable, and that would explain his affinity for Shakespearean drama in general and the name of the city of Richmond in particular. <laughs>
Henry VIII's illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy, the only one of Henry VIII's out-of-wedlock children he recognized as his own, had been given the title of the Duke of Richmond, made possible by his grandfather, the Earl of Richmond, who had killed Richard III and become the new King Henry VII, which is what what Shakespeare's play Richard the Third was about, and the title had been elevated from the Earl of Richmond to a dukedom just for Henry VIII's illegitimate son. <clears throat> Charles II would have an out-of-wedlock son, one of twelve from seven different women, and he was named seven different women and he was named the Duke of Richmond in 1675, and Richmond County in Virginia and Staten Island in New York were named after that Duke of Richmond. And the seat of the Duke of Richmond was the House of Goodwood, where a secret private airport would be built during Hitler's war. The Church of England had refused to acknowledge the out-of-wedlock son of Charles II, and given the crown to his brother James II, who had been the Duke of York when New York was named after him, and the colony of Jamestown had been named after his grandfather, James I. The county of Richmond was across the Potomac, Pot Potomac from Maryland, and the city of Richmond was 40 miles inland from the first British colony in America at Jamestown, and Jamestown was 40 miles up the James River from Old Point Comfort, and it had been in the summer of 1619 at Old Point Comfort that the first African slaves had been, lit, been landed on American soil. After performing an autopsy on John Wilkes Booth aboard the ironclad Montauk, an autopsy that included identification by ten eyewitnesses who had seen or known Booth. They refrained from taking any photographs that could become icons, and they weighted his corpse and dropped it into the Potomac River to keep the crazy Southerners from turning his bones into sacred relics. Mary Surratt's house had been torn apart by souvenir hunters right away until the police put a stop to it and the four executed conspirators were buried in graves just in front of the walls inside the arsenal, the military prison compound where they had been held and tried and hung from the gallows. Burying the bodies inside the compound would keep their remains away from the public, and Mary Surratt's daughter was demanding the return of her mother's bones, but would be denied for four years. Two years later, the pine coffins were moved to burial vaults inside a locked warehouse, and an anonymous deceased prisoner was added in John Wilkes Booth's place, so the military administrators would not be accused of being unchristian for having disposed of his body so cavalierly. Two years after that, Edwin Booth and Mary Surratt's daughter were given back the remains of their loved ones and George's family accepted his remains for reburial, and Powell was also laid to rest after some confusion over his whereabouts. Harold's mother and four sisters buried him next to his father, who had died at the age of 61 in October of 1864, a widely known and well-respected Mason, and his boy Harold had been introduced to everyone in the Navy Yard as his pride and joy, his beloved only son who had known all the secret passwords needed to get across the bridge that terrible night when Abraham Lincoln died. Harold thought that Powell was just going to knock on the door to find out if John Hay was there, and Powell's Whitney revolver had misfired, so it must not have been his own weapon, but one hastily lent to him, and neither he nor Booth had the Spencer carbines that John Surratt had stored at the Surratt compound, the guns they called shooting irons that were repeater rifles, even though the hammer had to be manually recocked after each magazine round was fired. Those guns had been stolen from the Union Army because the Confederates had been unable to manufacture them, and Booth thought he could get away with killing Lincoln in order to keep his, his beloved Lucy from being sent overseas but it wouldn't have made a difference for her to remain in Washington if she were casting her 
casting her gaze upon John Hay. <clears throat> One of John Hay's jobs had been to escort Mary and the children when they would take the train to the Jersey Shore to visit the re resort theater in Long Branch, New Jersey, where they were often accompanied by the Grants, and they would ride the train that left from the 6th Street Station where President Garfield would be assassinated in the presence of Robert Lincoln 16 years later. John Wilkes Booth had been bloviating all day about having seen Lucy with John Hay the morning of the assassination, and Robert Lincoln had also been there at the National Hotel with Lucy that day, and if Robert Lincoln had stopped in at the Star Tavern or been down at the National Bar, he may have made the suggestion that John Hay could be found at Seward's house. At the end of the day, while Booth was getting ready to kill the President, John Hay had been at the White House drinking whiskey with Robert Lincoln, and they would be brought together to pay their respects at Abraham Lincoln's deathbed. The military compound where the Lincoln conspirators were hanged would be renamed Fort Leslie J. McNair in 1946, and the new President Johnson did not like the military and did his best to limit its power in the South and so Johnson was brought up on charges via impeachment, but many thought it was because he was drinking too much. Congress balked at the final vote, so Johnson stayed in the Oval Office for another year, and the reason they had not removed Johnson from office was that the next in line was a man who wanted to give women the right to vote, and at the next election, General Grant was put into the presidency. During the Lincoln Conspiracy Tribunal, there had been a great deal of pushback against the federal government for wanting to hang a woman for the first time, and both Northerners and Southerners joined together in protesting against sending Mary Surratt to the gallows, insisting that it would make the Union government appear to be relentless and cruel, which is precisely why they did it and they made sure that her public hanging was well photographed and that those pictures were widely disseminated by the newspapers in order to send the unmistakable message that the new Union government meant business. When General Grant became president in 1868, he refused to ride the inaug to the inauguration in the same carriage with Johnson, and Johnson refused to go to Grant's inauguration at all. And after hanging the Lincoln conspirators, Hancock was posted in Baltimore, f Baltimore for a year under General Grant's direct supervision before being sent on his way out west to fight Indians. Seward would take a trip on the new Transcontinental Railroad in 1869 and meet with Brigham Young in Saint Salt Lake City, who had worked as a carpenter on the Seward house back in the day. And from the West Coast, Seward sailed to Alaska to survey the new American territory he had just bought from the Tsar of Russia in 1867. When Seward returned to Washington, D.C., he gave official notice that the Mormons were finding success in their endeavor to grow cotton in Utah, in a town they were calling Washington City. So from that time forward, people needed to stop using the name Washington City in favor of the name Washington, D.C. And it would take until 1877 for all federal troops in the South to be withdrawn, just 12 years following all the carnage. Because he had surrendered without keeping the war going throughout the summer, the Confederate President Davis had been released from jail in only two years with very few others spending any time in prison. None had been executed, and very little property was confiscated, although many of the last names of the people who had died for the South completely disappeared in America, many of them of French extraction. With all the sacrifice made in the war between the states, all the South really lost was their slaves, most of whom stayed to work for their old bosses, and the plantation owners were now too poor to hire workers, so they survived by selling off small parts of their land to independent farmers, who began sharecropping mostly cotton and tobacco, since they were cash crops. <laughs> 
Sharecropping was just like the old days, except that the owners quit being considerate towards their American workers of African descent because they were no longer the owner's personal property. After seven years, Congress passed the Amnesty Act <clears throat> that allowed all former Confederates to vote again, although a few hundred of them were barred from holding public office, and things soon enough went back to normal in the South, with people just staying home with their juleps and laudanum. Many Southerners were poor losers, and quite a few became outlaws and bandits like Jesse James, who would be killed by one of his friends for the reward money and the Ku Klux Klan emerged as a militia to bring order and safety amidst the chaos. Having had enough of the East and the South and the North, Fremont went decisively West, and Douglas MacArthur's father would restore Fremont's pension in 1890 to the tune of $2,000 a year. While America was busy with the war between the states, the Mexican government had borrowed $70 million from England and $10 million from Spain, and France sent an Austrian over to become the new emperor of Mexico. Mexico was being ruled from Mexico City by General Miriamon, who was collecting $12 million every year from the Mexican peasants and using it to make payments on the loans. Miramon was supported by rich folks and the Catholic Church, and anyone in Mexico with money was being attacked by an Indian named Juarez. Juarez was being supported by the U.S. in exchange for transit rights over the Isthmus of Tehuantepec that was 120 miles overland to the Pacific Ocean from Veracruz on the Gulf of Mexico, and the Isthmus of Panama was another 1,200 miles to the south of Veracruz and the Panama route was only 50 miles across, so it became the better place to build a canal, mostly for being able to circumvent having to deal with the dysfunctional Mexican government. Mexico had won independence from Spain in 1821 and turned itself into a Republican. The first Texans had been Catholics, and they had brought slaves with them which the Mexican government didn't like, so the Mexicans fought at the Alamo over the slavery question, but would lose the war a month later, and Texas became an independent republic, where hosting wealthy Europeans was a favorite pastime. Rifles were a newly improved wonder weapon, and people shot everything they could, and before long most of the wildlife in the southwest had been killed off. <clears throat> When President Polk offered $30 million to Texas, to Mexico, for Texas and California, Mexican California was less than 5% European, but the offer had been declined. And in 1846, Ulysses S. Grant, Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and W.T. Sherman went across the Rio Grande to lead men into battle that had been good practice for the upcoming American War between the states. The final Mexican peace treaty, signed in Guadalupe Hidalgo, won half of Mexico for the U.S. and gave the Mexican government $15 million, although no records remain of where that money went. And in 1850, the Mexican state of Texas gave up part of New Mexico for $10 million, and then the U.S. gave Mexico another $10 million in 1853 for the bottom slice of Arizona so they could put a railroad through. And in the end, Mexico received the same amount of money they had refused before the war with Mexico. Tales of the Wild West had inspired Europeans to overthrow their nobility in the year of revolutions in 1848. And news of the gold rush in California spread to Europe in 1849. And two million immigrants came over to America in the 1840s. After the Franco-Prussian War in 1870 between France and Prussia that was led by Bismarck, steamships would bring another 25 million Europeans over to the New World. The year of revolutions in Europe had begun with the Italians revolting against the Austrians, egged on by the French. And when the King of France fell in February, mobs marched through the streets of Austria, waving red flags. <clears throat> 
The dim-witted Habsburg Emperor Ferdinand was removed from the throne as the Austrian royal family had become terribly inbred. And in his place, Ferdinand's brother Franz Karl, who was married to Sophie, was passed over in favor of her eldest son, Franz Joseph, while the orchestra was playing Johann Strauss from 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. in, quote, the Vienna whose gorgeous soldiers waltzed better than they fought, close quote. The Cactus Throne, The Tragedy of Maximilian and Carlotta by Richard O'Connor, New York, G.P. Putnam's Sons, 1971, page 8. Napoleon's only son was being kept in Vienna, to keep him away from the French, lest they use him for a national awakening. And Napoleon's son was called the Eaglet, and his mother was an Austrian. Sophie and the Eaglet became inseparable with a secret passageway connecting their bedrooms, and right after her second son Maximilian was born, the Eaglet died when Sophie was twenty-six years old and the Eaglet was twenty-one. And Sophie's marriage had been six years old when her first son, Franz Joseph, had been born in 1831. When Max was born the year after Franz Joseph, people were surprised at Max's blonde hair and blue eyes, since the father had been darker-skinned with darker eyes. And a rumor persisted that Max was actually the son of the eaglet, and that Franz Joseph was the son of a Hungarian military officer and the eaglet died two weeks after Max was born. Sophie's third son was named Karl Ludwig, and he would have a son named Franz Ferdinand. And Sophie's fourth son was named Ludwig Victor, but nobody thought he was competent to be the Emperor of Austria because he enjoyed dressing up like a ballerina. Sophie was known as the Iron Lady or the Dragon Queen and her firstborn Franz Joseph became the Emperor of Austria when he was 18 years old, and his mother Sophie stayed around to give everyone hell, and she gave plenty of balls at the palace to find better girlfriends for her sons than the ones they were meeting in taverns. Franz Joseph's father was the son of the final official Holy Roman Emperor, when the title had been disbanded to keep it out of the hands of Napoleon. But everyone knew behind closed doors that on the 2nd of December in 1848, Franz Joseph had become the new Holy Roman Emperor, even though it was not made public lest the French get upset, which they would do anyway in 1870. But Franz Joseph stayed out of that, letting the Prussians have at the French, and for staying out of the Franco-Prussian War, the Austrians were allowed to keep their lovely port of Trieste. The Prussians had been victorious primarily from their use of railroads over which they transported their troops, and the surrender of France was signed at Versailles on the 27th of January in 1871, after 28,000 Germans had been killed and 90,000 wounded, while the French had, left, had lost <clears throat> 77,000 men killed and 138,000 wounded, with another 12,000 Germans and 45,000 French dying of sickness and disease. Franz Joseph had been 40 years old during the Franco-Prussian War, and his mother Sophie's second son Maximilian, Franz Joseph's younger brother, had fallen in love with the Countess von Linden, but the family killed the romance, saying she wasn't royal enough, and Max had been sent to sea with the Austrian Navy in 1850 with their beautiful gold and white uniforms. The purported patrimony of Franz Joseph was especially galling, because the Hungarians had been at the forefront of the revolutions in 1848, and Britain suggested that they make Max the King of Hungary, which would separate Austria and Hungary, but Emperor Franz Joseph just said no, because his mother Sophie had a plan for Austria to win Mexico and change America's name to New France, which is why she had named her firstborn son Franz Joseph, which had been the eaglet's middle name. At the right time, Sophie would share with the world the news that Franz was the new Napoleon and Sophie would remain the power behind the throne. <clears throat> the purportedly one-quarter French Max, 
came back from sea in 1854 when he was 22 years old, and they gave him plenty of money to build Austrian ships that were ironclad and had steam engines for power and had armor four and a half inches thick. And Max's big battleship was named the Kaiser and had 91 cannons that were a wonder to behold. In traveling with the Navy, Max wrote that the Moslem Pasha of Albania was, quote, a fat, delicate little mannequin whose unintelligible roaring, or rather grunting, nearly made me laugh openly in the face of this bloodthirsty tyrant. When his highness had refreshed himself, he was dismissed with a few bottles of stale champagne and was honored with a salute from our thirty-two pounders, which rather shook his nerves, close quote, the cactus throne, page forty and forty-one. Max made a state visit to the Pope and found him, quote, jolly as a cricket, and went to Mass, where he was, quote, disturbed by the nonchalance of the lesser clergy who engaged in a constant gabble while they exchanged various brands of snuff, close quote. The Cactus Throne, page 43. Max's older brother, Franz Joseph, had married his the first cousin of the Mad King Ludwig, and his mother Sophie thought Franz Joseph's wife was a peasant, and she was horrified that the new bride was a tobacco chain smoker. And Franz Joseph's wife tried to please her mother in law by naming her first child Sophie, but the little girl died at age two after contracting typhus during a trip to Hungary. Franz Joseph was seven years older than his wife, and they'd been married in 1854 when she was when he was 24 and she was 16. And Sophie's second son, Max, married Leopold I of Belgium's daughter Carlotta in 1857, when he was 25 and she was 17. And Carlotta's mother was French and her father was German, and her nickname was Carly. Max was given the job of ruling northern Italy from the incomparably lovely port of Trieste in 1859, but the Italians wanted the Austrians out. So Italy had asked the French to join them in battlefield maneuvers that readily ousted Austria from Italy, although they allowed Max to keep Trieste in exchange for Austrians la Austria's land in the Po Valley. Max and Carly built a beautiful castle at Trieste, made of white marble overlooking the ocean, and they called it Miramar, that meant behold the sea. And at the end of Hitler's war, the British would move into the Miramar castle until the Americans came and kicked them out. The French were dreaming of a magnificent French Catholic capital over in Mexico, built on top of the Aztec ruins, but their new colonies in the Golden Triangle of Southeast Asia were distracting them, and the Moslems were rioting in, in Algeria. In Mexico, the French were supported by those remnants of the rich Catholics that Juarez and his liberals had not yet crushed in the Mexican Reform Civil War of 1857 to 1861, and these wealthy few were in favor of Max becoming the new emperor of Mexico. A ball was held in Paris to send Max and Carly off to Mexico, and the American ambassador stayed home in their honor and Max was fitted up with a new French field marshal's uniform with the Grand Cross of St. Saint Stephen. And France, Spain, and Britain applauded the venture because they were angry over unpaid Mexican debts. A joint expeditionary force was sent to seize the Veracruz Customs House in Mexico in December of 1861, and the Europeans were felled all around Veracruz by yellow fever from the swamps and the Juaristas watched as the Europeans began to fight among themselves. Lincoln basically tolerated the French adventure in Mexico, knowing they would fall apart all by themselves, and the British and the Spanish sailed back home, and France sent more soldiers to replace them. Juarez had been elected the president of Mexico in large parts of the country, 
and in 1862, the French General Miramon started shooting up the Mexican countryside with the 28,000 troops sent from France as reinforcements after one-third of the French soldiers had succumbed to malaria and yellow fever, and things got even worse when Miramon wanted to marry a local girl who was 17 years old when he was at the age of 54 and Carly and Max allowed the marriage because they wanted the general to keep fighting the Juaristas. The French captured Mexico City in 1863, and when Max and Carly arrived at their new palace, there was so much lice in their bed that they had to sleep on the pool table. The Austrians gave General Miramon a big state wedding that distracted everyone for a week and caused all the military officers to have to travel to Mexico City for the occasion. And while the general honeymooned, Lincoln was assassinated. Juarez had worked for a while in a cigar factory in New Orleans, and then Juarez and his rebels began fighting the Mexican government, and they'd been at it ever since 1855. And when the French came over to launch the new Mexican Empire with Max on the throne, Lincoln supported Juarez because the French were in violation of the Monroe Doctrine, but more specifically because America didn't need France on its southern border during the war between the states. After its victory over the Confederacy in 1865, the U.S. sent 50,000 experienced combat troops to the Mexican border to make that point clear. And in 1866, France gifted America with the Statue of Lady Liberty as a reminder that France had started the whole revolution thing in the first place, and they wanted Americans to face it towards France, but the American, but America turned it around to face the American West. The second chapter of Luthi's book, France Against Herself, began... When the Christians of the West took up arms in the First Crusade, the fact that the King of France remained at home remained unnoticed, and nobody missed him. Several hundred soldiers went AWOL from the American War between the states to join up with the French adventure in Mexico. And among them were many officers, and they were mostly Confederate soldiers wanting to fight for Max to restore the rule of the nobility in the Americas. But the victorious American Union was not interested in seeing Southerners starting up new plantations in Mexico. However, no intervention was needed because Max got crosswise with the Southern runaways when he told them not to bring their slaves down to Mexico not out of personal preference, but because Max knew it would make the Union mad. It had been more challenging to keep the British at bay in Canada during the war between the states, and the working people of England strongly backed the North while the gov British government was still holding its breath after the year of revolutions in 1848, and they did not want to give the working class in England any excuse to rise up again should Britain take the South's side, so instead Britain supported the Confederacy under the table. The South bought a million Enfield rifles from Britain, and the CSS Alabama and the CSS Shenandoah were built in England, while the British pretended not to know where they were going. The Alabama and the Shenandoah, along with some other ships built in England, raided 450 Union vessels, burned 65 Union merchant ships, and captured over 2,000 Union prisoners. And after the war, Britain was made to pay damages done by these British ships flying the Confederate flag, a flag that looked eerily similar to the British Union Jack. The U.S. wanted to include making Canada part of America making Canada part of America part of the damages, but settled for the money. France had been on a roll after beating Russia in the Crimea and kicking Austria out of most of Italy in 1859, so sending Max to Mexico had seemed like a good idea at the time and would have made up for the Austrian defeat. <clears throat> France expected Prussia to lose the Seven Weeks' War in 1866, but Austria's ally Bavaria had just put the mad King Ludwig on the throne after the Bavarian king had died in 1864. 
and the new mad king Ludwig was more interested in listening to music by Wagner and planning his fairy tale castle building than in getting the Bavarian army prepared to fight Prussia. Like the new mad king Ludwig, Max was also young and in love and caught up in the music of the time, and Wagner was writing his Parzival while soliciting input from the new Bavarian king Ludwig, and Parzival was a story about a hero taking the throne away from a bad king. Max thought his Mexican adventure was romantic and exciting and important, and the Bavarians and the Bohemians shared a similar origin in the Celtic tribe of Bowie that had moved up and down the Danube into Hungary and Silesia, so Bavaria had been the land of the Bowari, while Bohemia had been called the land of the Bowie, and they were called the Bohemi by Tacitus. The town of Bologna also shared the ancestry of the Bowie, and was first called Bononia in the Po Valley a region covered with dense forests sheltering large herds of pigs, an enormously fertile land that yielded prodigious amounts of grain and boasted abundant wine harvests and was blessed with good grazing land. Navigation on the Po River was easy as far as Turin, while to the east in Venetia lived the non-Celtic Veneti people, and the Romans had made Romans of them all. <clears throat> With the mad King Ludwig of Bavaria on their side, things didn't look good for Austria in 1866 in the upcoming Seven Weeks' War with Prussia. And Britain made a deal with Prussia about Hanover before the hostilities broke out. While France wanted to stay out of the Seven Weeks' War, if Prussia won, then France's borders back home would be in danger, so France announced that all French troops would withdraw from, from Mexico in May of 1866, just in case Austria needed a little help beating Prussia, and the Seven Weeks' War would commence three weeks later. France and Austria had gone to war in 1859 over Trieste and France had sent 170,000 soldiers to Italy to join with 70,000 Italians, and Austria had sent 200,000 soldiers in this first war where railroads were used for troop transport, and peace had been declared in 1859 when Prussia had threatened to send in 132,000 soldiers, and although the Austrians lost, Max had been allowed to keep Trieste and start building his Miramar, Miramar Castle. The Austrians didn't mind the French getting some control of the Italian coast, because they knew it wouldn't last long, what with the British needing to control their sea lanes to India through the Mediterranean. In 1859, King Otto of Greece was a Bavarian and a cousin of Max's, and Austria still ruled the Danube flowing right down from Vienna into the Balkans through Belgrade before emptying into the Black Sea, and Russia and Austria had remained friends in their joint desire to keep the British from sailing into the Black Sea. Russia had wanted to take Constantinople back in 1852, because it had once belonged to them and remained the gateway to the Black Sea, and the British and the French were allies in the Crimean War from 1853 to 1856. But when the guns went silent, France got the short stick again, even though France had sent four times as many soldiers as the British to the Crimea. When France took most of their soldiers back home from the Crimea, the British were unable to march into Russia, and Britain had asked for a negotiated peace in Paris in 1856 when the Austrians threatened to come help the Russians. Now that Britain was free from the Crimea, they could turn their attention to the turmoil in the New World and to keep Britain out of Mexico. France and Austria worked up the plan together to make the Austrian Max the new Mexican Emperor, and that was seen by all of Europe as a good plan to keep the British out of the New World. To sell the idea to Britain, France told them that the Austrians could be used to force Mexico to pay off Mexican foreign loans to England. One of Max's brothers was married to one of the daughters of the Emperor of Brazil, and Max thought that in case of trouble he could get help from this good neighbor. <clears throat> 
Max wanted Central America to become the new Byzantium, and the first thing he wanted to do was build a canal across Nicaragua so that he could sail his Austrian navy to China. Britain hoped that Max would default on the loans he'd taken out for his Mexican venture, and then British troops could land after the French General Miramon had gone back home. And if the war between the states had not been won quickly by the South, Britain could come to their aid with troops from Mexico and turn America back into a British colony. Even if the war between the states did not end quickly, the British could wait in Mexico for the North and the South to exhaust themselves, and then the British could make their move. But that scenario was contingent upon the French and Austrian adventure in Mexico failing, and perhaps Max would have completed his canal through Nicaragua by then. <clears throat> when the French left Mexico to protect France's border during the Seven Weeks' War in 1866, each side was boasting 800 field guns, and Austria had 200,000 soldiers, but they would be beaten by 100, 130,000 Prussians at the Battle of Kerningratz on the 3rd of July, and the Austrians lost because Prussia had new Krupp rifles that could kill 10,000 Austrians in 20 minutes. The Prussians had gathered at Torgau and advanced to, to Dresden, while the Austrians retreated to the Elbe River, and the telegraph, telegraph lines had been cut, so two Prussian officers went on a midnight ride to develop to deliver orders to the Prussian troops that they were to attack at dawn. The Prussians had gathered at Torgau and advanced to Dresden while the Austrians retreated to the Elbe River. And the telegraph lines had been cut, so two Prussian officers went on a midnight ride to deliver orders to the Prussian troops that they were to attack at dawn and that would be the decisive battle of the Seven Weeks' War at Kerningratz, and after the war, Austria and Prussia would patch things up and become friends again. Kerningratz was where the Battle of White Mountain had been fought in 1620, and after Prussia won the Seven Weeks' War in July of 1866, what French were still left in Mexico began to leave in earnest to go back to France and prepare to defend the homeland. The French had started pulling out of Mexico the month before the Seven Weeks' War, and the King of France had told Max to leave with them, but Max wanted to stay. Though here I no longer have the breezes of the Adriatic or the air of La Croma, I am living in a free country among a free people, where principles prevail of which of which you at home cannot dream. I am no longer cramped by any fetters, and here I may openly say that I desire what is good. A healthier democracy prevails among us here, free from the morbid, fantastical character of that prevailing in Europe, but with a strength and conviction such as will perhaps not develop among you till after a hard struggle lasting, lasting fifty years. The Cactus Throne, page 151. The French people had welcomed sending soldiers to Mexico because so many of them had invested money in Mexican bonds. And in 1871, they would execute the man named Jecker, who had made the first loan to Mexico. Jecker was a Swiss banker who had loaned the Mexican government three million francs, and the Mexicans were supposed to issue Mexican bonds maturing to 75 million francs, but Jecker went bankrupt even before he had handed over all of the three million to Mexico. Jecker had convinced the French to keep up the payments to the Swiss bank, and the French had gone along with it because gambling was serious business in France and Jecker had been using the Mexican bonds as collateral in taking out further new loans. European countries had historically fought themselves into the ground and been left weak and vulnerable to other enemies, and many Europeans hoped the South would win the American war between the states so they could bring some kings and queens across the ocean, and that would lend some social grace to the uncouth Americans. Jefferson Davis had especially liked that idea, and so the Europeans had waited like vultures for America to wear itself out in the war between the states, but just the opposite happened. 
The tradition in Europe had been to force people to fight, but the Americans pitched in to the last person, and Americans fought furiously for themselves and their own destiny. And instead of bleeding the treasury dry, America was actually strengthened by the war that made industry boom.